If I go too fast, just stop me. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to see you all here this morning, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. I love this part of the world, and I would have come here even if it wasn't for the festival, um, because I, I love to spend time around this part of the world. Uh, but I wanted to say this to you, those of you who are interested in film. We have a saying, those of us who make films, which is that films beget other films. Films provoke filmmakers to make other films. Everything that I learned about filmmaking, I learned from watching the films of other people especially European filmmakers of the 1960s. And though none of the work that I've done resembles in any way the great European filmmakers whose works I love, they were the ones who inspired me. Uh, people like Alain René and Jean-Luc Godard and uh, Michelangelo Antonioni and Fellini, of course. And, and so many others going back, even H.G. Clouseau. But I was attracted to making films myself because I saw the films of these people. And some American filmmakers as well, like Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. That was really the film that provoked me to want to become a filmmaker more than anything. Because I realized when I saw Citizen Kane that, it, that cinema was more than just entertainment. It was as profound and as complex and as simple as great literature. So uh, I'll speak a little more uh, and, ask, and I'll answer all of your questions. I'll, I'll do some more talking, I hope. But I know that uh, Milton has a few words he'd like to say. Well, it's actually just a question for you, and you've already kind of started the whole process because a lot of what I was going to ask you just summarized uh, very succinctly. Uh, but I would like to go a bit back to the beginning, yeah. your career, um, because you came to Hollywood after a background in Chicago in documentary filmmaking. You came to Hollywood at a very significant time during a, a big time of change from the old Hollywood system um, when you made your first film in the late 60s it was a time when Hollywood was not only just looking for and welcoming new talent but in some cases desperate for it and wanting wanting to know where based on what had happened in the 60s where even entertainment was going um, so can you talk, you, you've talked about your influences and what got you inspired by filmmaking, um, mm -hmm. but how do you see yourself fitting into that era when many filmmakers were making their first films in Hollywood? Well, I got into filmmaking quite by accident. And almost everything that's happened to me as a filmmaker is accidental. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. I, st I never went to college or university. I went to high school. As far as uh, I went in school was high school. I, I'm not sure what the equivalent of that is here. Mm. What is that, medium school? Lycée. 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 That's, about, that's as far as I got. And I was a very bad student because I paid no attention whatsoever. I used to look out the window, or I, I was even a, a, a very bad boy. It's a, it's a miracle I never got expelled. But uh, when I finished with Elise, I had no idea what I wanted to do. But there was an ad in a newspaper. This was in the late 1950s. There was an ad in the newspapers that said, opportunities for young men, and it specified men, not women, not men and women, opportunities for young men to start 
at the bottom, in effect in the mail room, you know, where the mail gets delivered, and work your way up to becoming a television director. So I had no schooling whatsoever in television. I started in the mailroom, and because there were no schools that taught uh, directors, there were schools that taught technical, the technical part of television, but uh, there were no schools that taught you how to become a director at that time. So I started in the mailroom. Within about nine months, I was a, a, a floor manager, which is like an assistant director. And about nine months after that, before I was 18 years old, I was directing live television. And uh, uh, you learned on the job. You learned by doing. I learned by rote by watching other people do it. And uh, they let me stay in the control rooms and I used to write down if someone said something and then uh, what happened when, when the director said something. And I only got into film accidentally because I loved live television. But one of the things that I didn't like were, were big parties. I hated parties, and I hated to go to parties. But I went to one big party once. It was given by a, a very wealthy woman in Chicago, where I grew up. And this woman I had met through my work in television. She had produced a number of shows. And she invited me to a party in which there were a great many different kinds of people. There were university professors, there were uh, doctors, entertainers, actors. I don't know if you remember, there was a man called Lenny Bruce who was at this party. He was a very famous foul-mouthed American comic, but brilliant. He used to say a lot of bad words on stage and go to jail. I mean, the, the police used to wait for him in the nightclubs where he was speaking and he'd go to, he'd say something, four-letter word, boom, they'd run on stage and arrest him. Now it's on television all the time, what he said, but, and in the movies, of course. Uh, but, so, I went to this party, and there were about 150 people standing in a living room, and I found myself pressed up against a corner, and standing next to me, was a, a priest, a man in a priest collar and priest suit. And I introduced myself, and he introduced himself. His name was Father Robert Surfling. And I said, where is your uh, church, Father? And he said, well, I'm the priest at the Cook County Jail in Chicago on death row where the prisoners were who were going to be put to die in the electric chair. And I was sort of stunned, and I didn't know what to say to him, but I, I just blurted out. I said, have you ever met anyone on death row that you thought was innocent? And he said, yes, there's one guy. Uh, he's an African-American. He's going to die in six months in the electric chair. And I think he may be innocent. And so does the warden think he may be innocent. And he doesn't want to kill him. The war warden has killed three other people. And I listened to this, and I was fascinated. And then I sort of moved on, and he moved on. But I thought about this all weekend. Now, I had never made a film. I had only done live television. But something was implanted in, within me. And I called this priest at the Cook County Jail that the following Monday, and I asked if I could meet this prisoner, whose name was Paul Crump, C-R-U-M-P. And he arranged for me to meet this man, and I arranged with a, a live television cameraman that I worked with 
for the two of us to go in this prison and make a film to try and save this man's life. And ultimately, we, did, we had no idea how to go about making a film. But we learned while we, rent, we went to an equipment rental house in Chicago. And we said, if you teach us how to use a camera and how to get sound in sync with the camera, we'll rent your equipment. So I've had one lesson in filmmaking, and that was then. Most of you who've seen my films probably aren't surprised to hear that. <laughs> but I had one lesson in filmmaking. We went into the Cook County Jail, and I made a film about this man's life on death row, and I dramatized some of what he told me about how the Chicago police had beaten a confession out of him. And the film was made, and the governor of Illinois uh, wrote me a letter saying that he was going to pardon this man from death row because of my film. And, I, and the film won a number of documentary awards. And that's how I became a filmmaker and how he, how his life was spared from the electric chair. And, uh, yeah, no. No, I appreciate it. But I must tell you that that was my prime motivation, to save this man's life. It was a court of last resort. But because of the success of the film, I had these offers to go out to Hollywood, uh, where I did documentaries, first for the American Broadcasting Company and a company called Walper Productions. And this was the early 1960s. And as you pointed out, there was a vast change taking place in American cinema. It was provoked by a film called Easy Rider, which was made for very little money by people who were completely unknown as filmmakers. And the film was a great success. It was about the American drug culture. And it was like a road film. And so the studios in Hollywood were looking for other young filmmakers to make other such films. And that's how myself and people like Francis Coppola and Peter Bogdanovich and others who had not even studied film as Martin Scorsese had, who was a student um, at uh, New York University Film School. Uh, some came from film school, and other of, us of, others of us came from documentary, and there was a changing of the guard. The films that we were making were primarily influenced by the European filmmakers. And the films that the older Hollywood film directors were making were primarily influenced by old Hollywood. And the audiences became more and more interested in the so-called new Hollywood. Now, one of the things I'm going to say uh, at the Piazza Grande on Friday night, I'll share with you. We were not, on, my generation was not only influenced by the European filmmakers of the 1960s. We were influenced by the events of the 1960s in which America was going through a national nervous breakdown. It started with the assassination of John Kennedy and then later the assassination of Martin Luther King and then Robert Kennedy and then the onset of the Vietnam War in which America stumbled very badly and has really never recovered. And the decade of the 1960s ended with the Charles Manson murders. Are you familiar with the murder of Sharon Tate and a bunch of people for, for no apparent reason at all by a bunch of you know, sort of crazy, drug-infested people who were aimless and driftless and who were uh, sort of 
adrift from the American culture. And the Manson murders ended the 1960s. We came along in the 1970s, really, and made films that reflected what was going on in America. We weren't inventing things about American life. We were reflecting what we could perceive, which was paranoia everywhere and uh, irrational fear. And certainly my films of the 1970s reflected just that. And so did the films of, of my colleagues to a great extent. Well, um, to jump ahead to the 70s, although we should mention in the, the late 60s, you made three very disparate yet very accomplished films. Uh, the first film was Good Times, Sonny and Cher, uh, The Birthday Party Adaptation of uh, Penterplay, and The Night They Raided Minsky's. Uh, can you say just a bit about those first three films, which don't get talked about a lot. The Birthday Party I haven't seen since 68, but it was a fantastic adaptation. And during that period, how much were you working because it was a subject you wanted to do, or was it an opportunity to establish yourself in? Those first three films I made simply to become a filmmaker. And my advice to young filmmakers uh, uh, who want to have a career in film, Milton, is to do almost anything that you have a chance to do. Because the, just the act of working on a film is going to, you're going to learn what is necessary. But I'm going to tell you right now what's necessary so you don't have to go through it yourselves. Film is about communication, period. It's first about communicating with the people you're working with because it is the most collaborative of media. If you want to be a painter, you have only a blank canvas to stare at and your own God-given abilities. If you want to be a writer, you have either a computer that's blank or a blank sheet of paper. But to make a film, you have to work with a great, great many people who have a great many other skills. So you must be able to first communicate with them. You have to have confidence in yourself to do this kind of work. And if you don't, I would advise you not to go into this kind of work to become a filmmaker. You must believe in yourself and your own ideas. But you have to be able to communicate them first to your colleagues, but ultimately to the public. Because film is about communication. The first three films I made, the first one was with a, a pop group named Sonny and Cher. And, you know, I liked them a lot, but I had no interest in making a film with Sonny and Cher. But they asked me to do it, and so I did it, and I learned how to make a film. If I had made this film in Romania under Ceausescu, I would have been assassinated, you know, for making that film. It's, it's very inept. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, the other films I made early on, The Birthday Party is something I wanted to do because Harold Pinter is to me one of the great writers of the English language and I had an opportunity to adapt his great play, The Birthday Party, into film. And then the night they raided Minsky's came about because I was all of a sudden a hot young director in Hollywood. But the night they raided Minsky's is about burlesque in the 1920s, about which I knew nothing, uh, but learned on the job. Uh, but all of these films are now released on DVD in America, and they are revived in America quite often. But I'm, they were not personal in any way. Mm -hmm. To come to what is, I would say, considered your first personal film, um, apart from excellent work prior to that, is 
the French Connection. And the French Connection, from someone who was there when it came out, I'd like to talk about two things. First, the creation of French Connection and how it embodies a lot of your very personal themes. The other part is the phenomenon it became, because when it opened, it was, before it opened, it was just seen as yet another action policier coming out, yet it became a very popular film and I think then gave you a certain amount of power. Um, but going back to it, 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 it's the first film that shows your, your protagonists that are obsessed, driven, morally ambiguous, torn between polars of doing good and tempted by the bad side that runs pretty much through the rest of your work. Um, so do you want to talk about, and the other thing it did was bring in your previous documentary skill because what the French Connection is, is grounded in reality, uh, even though it's a genre film. So do you want to talk a bit about those various things? Sure, but, but first, don't leave out the boys in the band. Well, the boys in the band is a fantastic adaptation. The, the boy, I did the boys in the band before I did the French Connection, and it's just a great script, and something that I felt was both funny on the one hand and ultimately tragic on the other. But a great script that was offered to me by the writer, and uh, I felt it was also a great love story. Uh, in addition to being funny and very moving. But with the French Connection, I had felt for some time that there was a very thin line between the policeman and the criminal. That the very best policemen in the United States were those who thought like criminals. And so the French Connection is really about the thin line between the policeman and the criminal. And it's the first film in which I was able to, excuse me, uh, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, it was the first film in which I was able to use documentary technique. And by that I mean most of the films that were made before the French Connection, the camera was over here, the actors were over there. The camera was the fourth wall. There were, you know, the camera could usually go here or point there or point there at the same time. But it could almost never go from here to there to there over to here. Because back here is the crew. The lights, the crew, myself, a bunch of people eating sandwiches. <laughs> you know, paying no attention whatsoever uh, to what's going on, you know, uh, w reading the newspaper. But with a documentary, what you could do was you could move the camera anywhere. There was very small crew. And so I found that if, if, the people I was filming doing actual things in their own life, if they were, if someone got up from there and started to walk over back here, the camera could follow them and break the fourth wall and go 360 degrees around. And so I thought, why not try to make a feature film in this way where the camera could follow people anywhere at any time. Now that meant shooting with natural light. Not having a whole battery of lights over there or guys eating sandwiches or reading the newspaper or whatever, but giving the actors the ability as in real life to move anywhere at any time. And so when we filmed outdoors, which we did a lot of the time, there were no lights. I used natural light. And natural light is very beautiful, as we all know. When we filmed indoors, all of the locations were real. 
It was a real police station, a real bar room, whatever the location, they were all real. And so all we would do was take very small lights, little bounce lights, and uh, they were on little stands that could attach to the ceiling and just bounce the light off the ceiling and not have to be key lights, which were enormous lights that would light big cinema sets. And so I didn't use any sets in the French Connection. Everything was on location. All the light was bounce light or indirect light. And there was nobody standing behind the cameras. The crew was hidden away somewhere. And I realized that the camera could break the fourth wall. Because after all, cinema is really the illusion of depth. Cinema is really just, the screen is just height and width. But there is the illusion of depth, as there is in many great paintings, especially paintings by people like Vermeer, you know, where you're looking at, I don't know if any of you have seen the view of Delft, in which you're standing and looking at a scene in 17th century Delft, and you feel as though you're standing in the picture, and you have the illusion of depth for, for miles. So this, the camera has the illusion of depth. But okay, while you have the illusion of depth, you almost never are able to turn that camera around and see what's behind what is normally in front of the camera. So I encouraged my actors to move all around, and I followed them all around, and that became a style. Now, I was very fortunate in that I had a cameraman who was able to operate in this way. He was, an, uh, he was a Cuban cinematographer whose name was Ricky Bravo, and we, Enrique Bravo. And he was up in the mountains with Fidel Castro when Castro led his revolution, and they came down into Havana and took over Havana. Ricky photographed the Cuban Revolution at Castro's side. And so he was able to film anything, anywhere, at any time. He put the camera on his shoulder. Or if I wanted to make a, a tracking shot or a moving shot, usually you lay down tracks, as I'm sure many of you know. You, put the, you mount the camera on tracks and three or four guys push the camera along to go from, let's say, here to, let's say, over to here or wherever. But Ricky Bravo, he didn't need tracks. He said, just get, get me a wheelchair and have somebody push me in a wheelchair and I'll follow these people. And because he could do that, or because he could even walk with the camera in his hands and keep it smooth, uh, I was able to formulate, the, to induce, and that's really what I call it, Milton, inducing the documentary technique into feature film. And it, it was because of a whole bunch of conditions that made it possible to do that. Like a cameraman who had photographed reality in the past. And I wanted the French Connection to look real and to feel real, like it was happening. Not like we staged anything, but like the audience was there while everything was happening. In addition to this documentary aspect to the French Connection, it also is a very, in terms of the personal story, a very intense uh, and naturalistic one at the same time. Um, I know that part of your interest is in these dramatic situations, in character, in story, although you have a great, great facility with all of the technical aspect. Your, your primary concern seems to be the character and the story. So can you talk a bit about working with actors and, and achieving that on the screen, starting with the French Connection, I would say? 
Well, almost nobody who's in the French Connection was an actor that I really wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I had this casting director. His name was Bob Weiner. And Bob was not really a casting director. He was a, a critic for a counterculture newspaper in New York called The Village Voice. Have any of you? OK. <laughs> Is there anyone here who has not heard of the Village Voice? <laughs> okay, the Village Voice was a counterculture paper. But Bob Wiener knew all kinds of actors. Bob Wiener saw every off-Broadway play, and he saw every independent film, and he knew actors that other casting directors didn't know. And so I hired him to be the casting director on the French Connection. And I, we, we had the same kind of uh, interest. Oh, hi, hello there, folks. How are you? I didn't know you were there. Uh, we had the same interest in films, and we used to speak in shorthand, Milton. There was a great film by Luis Bunuel, the, you know, the great Spanish director called Belle de Jour. Is there anyone here who's not familiar with Belle de Jour? <laughs> I'm in the right place there. If you're not familiar with Belle de Jour, get the hell out of here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I said to Bob Wiener, you know that guy that he, he was unshaven, the guy who played uh, the bad guy in Belle de Jour, I didn't know his name. And, uh, you know, he was one of the two bad guys. The other guy was played by Pierre Clementi. And uh, Bob said, Bob came back to me, he said, oh yeah, the guy you want, his name is Fernando Ray, and uh, he's available. And uh, so I said, okay, hire him. I hadn't met Fernando Ray, I just, Bob told me that that was the actor I was interested in. I said, let's hire him to play the French guy, Charnier, you know, the leading bad guy in the French Connection. We hire him, and I, I went down to the airport in New York to pick up Fernando Ray and drive him to his hotel and introduce myself to him. And I get to the airport, and I'm looking at all the passengers getting off the plane. In those days, you could do that. And uh, I don't see the guy I'm looking for. And then I get paged to come to the American Airlines uh, desk. And there is a guy waiting for me who I sort of vaguely recognize, but it's not the actor from Belle de Jour. But it was Fernando Ray. And I, I introduced myself, and he's a very distinguished looking man with a little goatee, and he was very immaculately uh, dressed. And, and the guy he was playing was supposed to be a very hardcore uh, Corsican guy, a Corsican gangster. And I look at this guy. And it's not the guy at all. And I, and I, I introduced myself, and I said, uh, oh, uh, Mr. Ray, uh, we get in the car, and I'm driving him to his hotel. And I said, you weren't in Budwell's film, Belle de Jour, were you? He said, oh, no, no, I wasn't in Belle de Jour. He said, I, I've made other films for Budwell. He, he Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, and many other, but not Belle de Jour. And he said, I'll tell you how uh, Bunuel found me. Bunuel was asked to see a film about an, with another actor. And <laughs> I, I was just starting out, and I was playing a corpse. I was a dead man in a coffin. <laughs> and Bunuel was asked if he liked the actor that they brought him to see. And he said, no, I don't like that actor. But the guy who played the corpse is terrific. <laughs> And that was Fernando Ray. 
He wasn't in Belle de Jour. And so now we're driving to his hotel, and I said, you know, this fellow you're playing, he, he can't have a little goatee like the one that Milton has. <laughs> and Fernandez said, oh, no, you, you, you don't want me to, you'd never want me to shave my goatee because my face has scars all over it. I have pimples all over my chin, so I can't shave my goatee. Uh, he said, by the way, I don't speak very much French at all. <laughs> he said, you know, I'm Spanish. He said, I speak a little French. I said, bonjour. He said, what? <laughs> so now I get him to his hotel, and I go to the lobby of the hotel where there used to be telephone booths. And I called my production office where the casting director was, Bob Wiener. And I said, you stupid idiot. <laughs> I said, what have you done? This is the wrong guy. And he said, what? I said, he said, it's Fernando Ray. I said, yeah, but he's not the guy from Belle de Jour. So Bob said, well, let me see what happens, what's wrong. When I got to the production office, he said, you're right. The guy from Belle de Jour was a guy called Francisco Rabal. Uh, I said, well, you have to fire Fernando Ray and get Francisco Rabal. Okay. Found out that Francisco Rabal was, of course, also Spanish spoke no English at all, and was unavailable. And so we had to go with Fernando Rey, who was not my idea of this character at all. And then it came down to casting the lead, Gene Hackman. There were four other people I wanted. They were either not available or they all turned us down. Uh, there was a guy called Peter Boyle. And he, he, he made a film at the time called Joe, which was about a racist. And he was a big, tough-looking guy who looked like a cop. And we offered the part in The French Connection to him. And he turned it down. He had just played this bigot, and he said, you know, I mean, Peter was a big guy who later played Frankenstein, you know, for Mel Brooks. He was Frankenstein in Mel Brooks. But he turned down the French connection, he said, because I just want to do romantic films, the rest of them. <laughs> so finally, an agent suggested Gene Hackman. And my producer and I had lunch with Gene Hackman, and I actually fell asleep at the lunch. <laughs> I, I thought that he was one of the most boring people I had ever met. <laughs> and I said to the producer, we can't go with this guy. And we had two weeks left to make the picture. And finally, the head of the studio, Dick Zanuck, said to us, look, you have to start this film in two weeks because I'm going to get fired over here. I won't be at this studio when you guys finish the movie. If you don't start it now, you don't have a movie. And so that's how we went with Gene Hackman and Fernando Ray. It, it was the movie God. And I had to do a lot of work with Gene Hackman to get him into that role. But let me give you maybe a better illustration of, of how you work with actors, a film I made called The Hunted with Tommy Lee Jones and Benicio Del Toro. And I told some of you yesterday who I had lunch with, Tommy Lee Jones is a very brilliant guy. He went to Harvard University, which is, you know, a major college in America. He was Al Gore's roommate, very brilliant guy. He's a no-nonsense guy. And when you work with Tommy Lee Jones as an actor, you don't discuss character. You don't talk about why he has to do this or that 
or what is there in his background that makes him do this or that. You just say, Tommy, you walk in from over there. You come over here. You say hello to Milton. You sit down. You pick up a mic. Then you start talking to the group here. And then you finish and you leave. And he says, let me see if I've got this straight. <laughs> I come in there. I go over. I shake hands with Milton. I sit down. I pick up the mic. I stand here and talk for a while. And then I leave. That's it. He says to the assistant cameraman, OK, son, put a mark over there, put a mark over here, put a mark over there, put a mark over here. I'm ready. <laughs> and he does it. With Benicio del Toro in the same picture, why do I have to walk in from there? <laughs> why can't you just find me sitting over here? What is there about my character that would make him want to get up and walk over here? What did he do when he was 12 years old? <laughs> what was his father like? None of which has been written. None of this is in a script anywhere. So you have to make up a lot of bullshit. <laughs> you just make up stuff. And he says, uh-huh. <laughs> So when you were 12 years old, you had a very bad experience with your father. <laughs> and you, you hate your father so much, so transfer that hatred to Tommy Lee Jones. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I have these two guys who were completely differently in the same movie, in the same shot. And while I'm explaining, making up all these lies for Benicio Del Toro, Tommy Lee Jones is going, oh, God. <laughs> and that's very often what you'll find in the same picture. An actor who just wants to get on with, there's a very famous story about Dustin Hoffman and Laurence Olivier, who made a movie called Marathon Man. And Dustin Hoffman is a guy who likes to do 25 or 30 takes. I think he may have stock in Eastman Kodak or something. <laughs> but Sir Lawrence Olivier is a guy like Tommy Lee Jones. You come in here, you go over there, yes, I'm ready. And so the two of them are in the same movie, Marathon Man. And at the end of the picture, when the film was over, they had a big cast party. And Dustin Hoffman gets up to toast Sir Lawrence Olivier, who is one of the greatest actors in the English language. And he says, Sir Lawrence, I don't know how you do it. You just come in, and you're ready, and you do your role. You ask no questions of the director, nothing. And I have to go through all of this other stuff to get myself in the right mood. What? How do you do it? And Olivia said, it's called acting, my son. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> so both on the acting front, the documentary front, the technical front, the popular front, French Connection was a great success and won you Academy Award for Best Directing um, and four other Oscars, I think. Um, interestingly enough, I think also a uh, Oscar for screenplay when you've made note many times that you had no script going into that film. Um, at that point, did you have your pick of what you wanted to do? Because your next film, The Exorcist, was even a greater phenomenon, although in that case, it was a very known story based on a popular book. So uh, would you like to know how, how I got to do The Exorcist? Would you be interested in that? One day, I was asked by a great film director, producer named Blake Edwards. Do you know who Blake Edwards is? You don't know who Blake Edwards <laughs> uh, 
Blake Edwards, I was a young director, and Blake Edwards asked me to direct the film version of a television series that he had called Peter Gunn. You may never have heard of that, but it was a very popular series in America about a private detective, and the character was all was based on Cary Grant's personality. And Peter Gunn had a score by Henry Mancini, which really, the score for Peter Gunn became the basis, the foundation for rock and roll music. This particular beat, this particular tempo, a guitar solo, da 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 that was the theme for Peter Gunn. Pretty good, huh? Would you like me to sing a song, too? Any requests? Uh, and Blake Edwards asked me to read the script that he uh, supposedly had written of Peter Gunn and then come back and direct the movie that he was only going to produce because he wanted the input of a young filmmaker and that's what I was. I read the script and I thought it was terrible. And very often, honesty is the best policy. I went back to see Blake, who I greatly admired, and I said, Blake, I think this script is awful. And I, I, you know, I can't do this script. I can't believe that you would want to make, take your great television series and, and just do this stupid script. Now, Blake Edwards was a giant, and I was a dwarf in the film business. And Blake didn't take that too well. But he, he picked up his intercom, and he said, send Blatty in here. And in walked a, a very nervous guy called William Peter Blatty, who, it turns out, had actually written the script of Peter Gunn that Blake put his name on. And Blake said, Mr. Friedkin, meet Mr. Blatty. Mr. Friedkin is going to tell you, Mr. Blatty, what he thinks is wrong with your script. I then proceeded to do so as honestly, but with a great deal of embarrassment. I told him as honestly as I could why I didn't like it. And then I, Mr. Edwards excused me and I left. And I, as I was leaving the Paramount Studios, Bill Blatty came running after me, and he said, Mr. Friedkin, you're the first guy that's told Blake the truth since I've been working for him. And I really appreciate that, because you're right. The script is no good. And that's the last time I saw Bill Blatty for a number of years. And uh, Bill had written um, other screenplays for Blake, one called A Shot in the Dark, where he invented the character of Inspector Clouseau. And Bill was known for comedy writing. One day I'm on the road publicizing The French Connection, and a, a big package arrived in the mail, which I took with me to about eight cities without opening it. It was from William Peter Blatty. And I remember hating his last script. But I, here's this, it's obviously a manuscript. And I don't open it because I'm not interested in it. And finally, I finished my tour. And I got to San Francisco, which was the end of my tour. I finished my interviews at 5 in the afternoon. And uh, I sat down. I had three hours until dinner. And I opened the manuscript, and I started to read The Exorcist. And by 7 o'clock, I called my date for dinner that evening. I canceled dinner, and I finished reading this absolutely compelling, incredible piece of work. And there was Bill's phone number 
on the script, and I called him and I said, Bill, what is, what is this? And he, he told me, and he said, would you like to direct it? He said, because I'm going to produce it, and I'd like to have you direct it. He said, but I'll tell you the truth. It's been turned down already by Stanley Kubrick, Arthur Penn, a uh, couple of other people. Stanley Kubrick, Arthur Penn, Mike Nichols. All three of them had turned it down on the grounds that you could not get a performance out of a 12-year-old girl to do what was in that book. And I read it, and I saw the whole film in my mind's eye. I said, Bill, I'd, I'd love to do this. And so he went to Warner Brothers, and I had just recently started to become infamous as a result of the French Connection, won an Academy Award by the grace of God, and so Warner Brothers hired me to do The Exorcist. And in the course of doing it, I found out that it was based on a true story, that it was a case that took place in 1949 in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is near Washington, D.C. It was the case of a 14-year-old boy, not a 12-year-old girl. And Blatty was an undergraduate at Georgetown University, which is also near Washington, D.C., a suburb of Washington. And Blatty, as an undergraduate at Georgetown, read about this case, which was widely publicized in the Washington Post in 1949. And he tried to get information about it from the priests at Georgetown, which was a Jesuit school, and he couldn't find out anything more than was in the newspapers. And so he wrote the story as fiction. He made the 14-year-old boy a 12-year-old girl, and he invented all the other characters based on this actual case. It turned out that the case was one of only three in the United States that the Catholic Church felt was an authentic case of demonic possession and authorized an exorcism. Now, there are other places in the world where many more exorcisms are performed. But in America, this was the third one as of 1949. And so once I realized it was based on an actual case, I realized that I could do that with a kind of documentary technique as well. And I got to know the president of Georgetown, who had in his files the diaries, not only of the priests who were involved in this case, but of the doctors and the nurses who were involved, because the actual exorcism was performed at Alexian Brothers Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, in a hospital. And the doctors and nurses all kept diaries, and I read them. And it seemed that either this was a case of demonic possession, or it was mass hallucination. And so that became my approach to the film. I might have done it as a, a, a flat-out horror film if I didn't realize that it was based on actual events. The realism, I think, extends even into, and this is a film that you did, <clears throat> apart from the Georgetown locations, do in a, a set, uh, all of the interiors of the house. But it's still ground. It feels very real. It feels like a real house. There are no expressionistic techniques. Once you get into the room with the effects, it all still feels very real within what is happening. Um, can you talk a bit about that production, because I know it was a very long production. Um, was that length due to getting the performances, getting the effects? Um, what was that experience? Well, it was both. We had no computer-generated imagery then, so everything you see we had to do, as with the French Connection. We had to do all that stuff, and we had to achieve levitation in The Exorcist, and achieve everything that you see in the film. We had to do it with a 12-year-old girl. And first, I, you know, the film, if it's effective at all, it's because of the performances are so great. Now, Ellen Burstyn, who plays the lead, 
was not a star. She had only done supporting roles, but she was a really fine actress. The studio wanted Audrey Hepburn or Jane Fonda or... Uh, Wasn't Shirley MacLaine at one point? Considered? Bill based the character on Shirley right. MacLaine, who he had worked with mm -hmm. uh, in a film called uh, What, what a, way a Way to Go. Or right. so. But uh, Bill Blatty. But, and, or they wanted Jane Fonda who had recently won an Academy Award the same time I did. So they went, we went first to, uh, to Audrey Hepburn. And Audrey Hepburn said she would make the film, but it had to be done in Italy because she was married to an Italian and she, hello, Olivia, I didn't see you there behind your dark glasses. The next director of the Locarno Film Festival, uh, Olivier Pair, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand up, please. <laughs> Olivier Pitt. Uh, Anne Bancroft said she would do it, but we had to do it in Italy. And I, I said, I really didn't want to leave America to make the film. You know, I, I, I would not be on familiar terms working, you know, w with an Italian crew. I had my crew from the French Connection. I, I had a way of working, and I needed an, an altogether, you know, cast of Americans with one or two exceptions. So I said, we asked Audrey Hepburn to come to Los Angeles, which she refused to do, so she didn't do the film. They then went to Anne Bancroft, who said, she would love to do the film, but she was nine months pregnant, and would we wait for her? And the studio didn't think so. And we also thought that, well, even if we waited nine months, she would then fall in love with her baby and not want to go to work right away, which was true. They then went to Jane Fonda. And Jane Fonda read the script and said, why would I want to be in a piece of capitalist bullshit like this. <laughs> so she didn't do the film. And then Ellen Burstyn called me and said, Mr. Friedkin, we've never met, but that's my part. I am that woman. Can I see you? I'd never met her. I said, OK, come into my office. She said, I'm not, I don't want to go to your office. Come to my house. You live on the way, I'm sure. So I stopped at her house. She was about 50 pounds overweight, wearing a shift. And I said, look, Ellen, the, the studio wants major star actresses. She said, don't worry, I'll wait. I said, but you know, you, you're 50 pounds overweight. And she said, I'll lose the weight if I get the role. So finally, there was nobody else that they wanted. And I went to the head of the studio, whose name was Ted Ashley. Ted Ashley was a very interesting man. He's formerly the head of a talent agency. And Ted Ashley got up from behind his desk when I said I'd like to have Ellen Burstyn play the lead. And he said, Bill, he said, I trust you with this film totally. I'm sure you'll do a great job. He said, but Ellen Burstyn will play the lead in this movie over my dead body. <laughs> he said, let me show you what I mean. He got down on the floor <laughs> of his office next to his desk, and he said, walk over my... <laughs> and I, I, no, Ted, come on. He said, just try and walk over my body. So I start to, and he grabs my leg. He said, I will come from the dead if I have to. Ellen Burstyn will not play the lead in The Exorcist. The rest is, of that is history. Then I must mention how I cast Linda Blair. There were th literally thousands of young girls that auditioned for that part. And all over America, they were put on videotape, and it, it seemed impossible. It was just not possible to get a 12-year-old girl 
who could either understand this material or relate to it or act it. And so then we started to look at 16-year-old women who looked younger and 15 and 40. I couldn't cast the part. And one day we were, we had to announce a start date. I had no one to play that part. I'm sitting in my office at Warner Brothers, and my secretary rang me and said, there's a woman outside. She doesn't have an appointment. Her name is Eleanor Blair, and she had, has her daughter with her who's 11. Would you see her? And I said, OK. They came in. They walked in the door. And instantly, I knew this was the girl. Instantly. Before she opened her mouth, I knew she, she was the one. But she sat down with her mother. And she had the quality that I most look for in an actor, which is intelligence. She sat down. Remember now, she's 11 years old. And I said to her, Linda, do you know what The Exorcist is about? And she said, well, yes, it's, it's about a 12-year-old girl who gets possessed by the devil and does a whole bunch of, of really bad things. And I said, well, like what? What does she do? And she says, well, she hits her mother across the face and uh, she pushes a man out of her bedroom window, and she masturbates with a crucifix. And I said, do you know what that means? She said, what? I said, masturbation. She said, yes, it's like jerking off, isn't it? <laughs> now, her mother is right there. Go ahead. Linda had never acted before. I said, have you ever done that, Linda? She said, what, masturbate? I said, yes. She said, sure, haven't you? <laughs> and so I hired her. No audition, uh, nothing. I just hired her. And she was just wonderful to work with, a very bright, astute, charming young girl. It was only possible to make that film, Milton, because of her attitude about the material. She was not freaked out by it, which if she had been, it would have freaked out the crew and everybody else and the actors, and we couldn't have done it. So there is a thing, there is something out there called the movie God. The movie God brought me Linda Blair, and Ellen Burstyn, and Gene Hackman, and Fernando Ray. It was through no genius of my own, and, and, and many others like that. And then we, in order to achieve the effects, it was all trial and error for several weeks before we shot the film. We went back to New York, and, and we just all came up with ideas of how to achieve this until it looked like we could we could do it mechanically, because there was no other way to do the effects optically. Even to show breath in the room, when the room was supposed to be cold. In the old days, when they made movies and they showed uh, breath on people who were outdoors or something, they shot the scene at a place called the Glendale Ice House, which was a place where they used to manufacture big, <clears throat> big kegs of ice. But the Glendale Ice House was long gone. Ice was now being manufactured in small cubes. And so we had, a, we had to get restaurant air conditioning units that were the size of each of these panels. And we had to put these units up on four sides of the set. And at the end of a day shooting, we turn on the air conditioning units. And the next morning, the set would be 40 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. And when the minute the movie lights went on, after an hour, it would go back up to 32 degrees, and the breath would no longer show. So we had to shut down again in that scene until we could build up the cold. So that's why that took a long 
time to do. Um, and then we found out that if you didn't uh, sidelight breath, we had to put little side lights hidden all over the floor or back lights because it turned out if you didn't, if you just front lit breath, it didn't show on film. You had to side light it or back light it, and that was discovered, you know, by trial and error. A lot of the film was trial and error. I wonder if you want to open to yeah. questions. Yeah, let's see uh, if anyone has questions. I'm sure you do. How did I get Ellen Burstyn when I had that opposition from the studio? I finally said to Mr. Ashley that I had talked to her a number of times. I felt she understood the role. She was a great actress. You don't need a star. The story is the star. And against his better judgment, he went along with me. And about 10 years later, after the film had earned the studio around a billion dollars worldwide, I ran into him at a, uh, a banquet at the Museum of Modern Art where everyone was in black tie. And I, I said, I hadn't seen him for 10 years. And I said, well, you see, Ted, I guess I was right about Ellen Burstyn, huh? He said, if we had had Jane Fonda, we'd have done $2 billion. <laughs> uh, here in Locarno, we saw um, a documentary about uh, Andre Vaida. And he said that um, working with movies is just a job. But there are two uh, creative moments that are casting and choosing a story. I really agree. Well, it must be an ordinary job because I can do it. Uh, I never, I never, and to this day, I don't think of myself as an artist at all. I feel it is a job, but I love it. You have to have great love and passion for it. Uh, Andre Weisda is, is an artist and a great filmmaker. Uh, but... It is a combination of a number of things that seem to come together. The casting, of course. Then the, the makeup of the crew has to be just the right chemistry. The story has to be something, and you never know until it's finished, that will interest people other than yourself, and hopefully in other countries. And then there's the editing process, which has an enormous effect on the outcome of a film. I've seen some very interesting films be ruined in the editing room after many, many audience screenings where they've changed the film. But so there are all those uh, arts, the art of acting, the art of cinematography, the art of editing, uh, that, that must come together to make a film that other people want to see. But no, I don't think of myself as an artist at all. Vermeer is an artist. Rembrandt is an artist. Mozart was an artist. Uh, I'm a film director. But Andre Wajda, to me, is a, is a great artist. Any other? Yes. I uh, before you said, and, and rightly so, that uh, editing is one of the most important part of a movie in which you can really uh, completely change what has been shot. And I, I would like to ask you, what was your relationship with your movie editors? The level of control that you had, for instance, uh, in some of your movies, there are very important uh, uh, scenes like the car chase in the French Connection of the uh, fake money printing in uh, Live and Die in, uh, in LA that are uh, very fastly paced and in which like uh, a fraction of second, more or less, in, in each uh, frame can, can change completely the, the, the pacing of the movie. Uh, what level of control you had on that? And uh, I would well, like that. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday to some of you at lunch, before I start a film, I see the whole film in my mind's eye, literally. I see the film. The sequences you mentioned, 
I know exactly how I want to do them. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no other way to put them together. Uh, now, another director coming in might have put the same scenes together differently. But I, I work with editors who basically work as a pair of hands with me. I know exactly what I want to do, and I do it. And I'm either right or wrong. However, the editors often contribute good ideas, and I often change what I had in mind. If an editor says, hey, what about this? And shows it to me another way, and I think it's better. But I know what I'm going for. I'm not fishing around to figure out where the movie is. I've, I've seen it before I shot it. If you were on the set for any one of the shots of the French Connection, you would have been bored. Because one, it's, they're made one shot at a time, like knitting. You know? You know how boring it is to watch someone knit? <laughs> have you ever watched someone knit? That's what filming is like. That's what filming the chase of the French Connection was. One shot at a time. One stitch at a time. And it's all, it all comes to life in the editing room. Magically, you know, th through the language of cinema. And to me, the ultimate aspect of that language is in the editing room. The bottom line is what happens in the editing room. The, to me, the film is raw material for what you do in the editing room. Can you talk a bit about your interest in the uh, DVD versions, the Blu-ray versions of your films? Because I know you're, you're very involved in their production and very high on the quality that can be done. Because of DVD and Blu-ray, films are going to be preserved forever. Before that, you couldn't see in America a, a film by Andre Weisdahl. It would play in some remote art house cinema somewhere, if at all, or the great films from all over the world. The true Cinematheque is the DVD. It's a little thing. You can put it in your jacket pocket instead of a great big cans of 35 millimeter. It's because of DVD and Blu-ray which is often of a better quality now, not always, but often, that every single film that's made will be preserved. And you can have it at home and watch it wherever you want, or you can rent it through the mail. And how could you do that before? You know, the ability for me to see films from Europe, especially films from, you know, Czechoslovakia, or Romania, or, uh, you know, even Japan and, uh, and Asian countries, China. It, it was impossible. And even the great American classic films, you couldn't see them except in very rare, little old, what we called art houses. And there were there are very few of those left, but there are these DVDs and Blu-rays so I work on the, on the DVDs of all of my films now. I time them frame by frame by frame so that the color is exactly what I want and the sound is exactly what I want, which I could never achieve through the print process, which was very limited. Well, <laughs> I want to congratulate Bill again. Uh, and we're very happy to bestow the Leopard of Honor, uh, the 20th anniversary one this year, to William Friedkin. Um, thank you, Bill, thank for your work. You and uh, thank you for being a great audience. Thank you.